Hello, and welcome back to the massive YouTube iceberg. Today we'll be finishing up tier 4, but before we do that, one of my commenters pointed out that I accidentally skipped over one of the entries from the last video. I don't even know how it happened. I had it recorded and everything, and I guess I just forgot to put it in the last one. So I'll do that first and get on with the rest of the list. Seven Awesome Kids, formerly known as Seven Supergirls, was a YouTube channel supposedly run by a group of seven underage girls, ranging from ages 8 to 18, that first joined in 2008. Their videos would consist of vlogs, skits, DIY stuff, and just a lot of stuff you'd expect young girls to be posting about. There were several channels under the brand, such as Seven Awesome Kids, Seven Perfect Angels, Seven Fabulous Teens, etc, etc, with the most popular one having around 9 million and a half subscribers. On the surface level, nothing was really wrong with these channels, however, in August 2018, the real owner of the channel, Ian Rylet was arrested due to allegations of sexual exploitation. He apparently made one of the 16-year-old girls dress in front of him, verbally abused her, and also began groping her. He was sentenced to three months in prison, five years of probation, and was banned from holding any job that would involve minors whatsoever. All of his YouTube channels were also terminated, making Seven Awesome Kids the most subscribed YouTube channel to be terminated, at least for the time. Kinda didn't want to start the whole video on something like that, but hey, I guess that's my fault. Possibly in Michigan is a short horror film released in 1983 by Cecilia Condit, with music by Karen Sklandy. The story of the short film follows two women walking around a shopping mall while being followed by a strange man in a weird mask. It features surrealist humor and touches on the predatory nature of dating and romance. I'm personally not very well versed in horror media, but the general consensus says that this is a very unique piece of art, and I've gotta say I really have never seen anything like it. As the top comment mentions, it's kind of hard to imagine this is like a real piece of media that people created, you know? It's one of those. Just talking about it, I can't really do it justice. I'd recommend watching it for yourself if you're interested, as with anything mentioned in the series. YouTube ads can vary between a lot of things, at least when you're not getting the same five, like Liberty Mutual or TikTok ads. The criteria to get your ad on YouTube was surprisingly, at one point, very loose. For example, controversy arose around 2018, leading up to the release of the horror film in the Conjuring series The Nun. An ad aired across all of YouTube for this film. It starts with a black screen with a text caption that tells you to come closer to the screen, then shows a volume slider that slowly goes up, and then without warning, an incredibly loud jump scare of the titular nun shows up on screen in a ghost car-esque method of advertising. How this was even allowed to be a YouTube ad is beyond me, and people really didn't take kindly to it, and for good reason. Another example of a creepy YouTube ad is, well, Bob Hickman, the God has entered my body guy. Some people have documented that they've received some of his videos as YouTube advertisements, so apparently they're just letting anyone in at this point. I actually forgot to mention this aspect about his channel when I covered him, like, literally last video, so I'm glad this wasn't far behind. Bob just really loves getting his word out. Other creepy YouTube ads include NSFW sex ads, which are probably creepy if you're, like, 12. This Linkin Park 100 Gex ad that people were getting. A Japanese guy named Boxman who talks into the camera wearing a costume made of cardboard boxes. And Dr. Itch, a German user who also talks on the camera while wearing a strange costume while pitching his voice up. These are all pretty weird and not what you'd expect from an advertisement on YouTube, although honestly I wish I had these instead of the same ones I kept getting. Besides the nun one, fuck that. Benjamin Bennett is a YouTuber who is most popular for being the host of the series Sitting and Smiling, where he just sits down in front of a live stream for four whole hours and smiles. That's it. He just sits there and smiles. He doesn't speak, never changes his facial expression, and doesn't even move. Of course, that's not to say every video is alike, as in some of them, certain things happen that are beyond Benjamin's control. In episode 5, a burglar breaks into Benjamin's house and finds him sitting and smiling, and says, Hello? Benjamin completely ignores him in favor of doing his thing. The burglar then just straight up leaves, presumably intimidated by his presence. In episode 52, Benjamin seems to piss himself with a large puddle slowly emerging from below his leg. In episodes 238 and 257, he begins crying halfway through for unexplained reasons. When asked why he does this series at all, he said to Vice Media, There isn't really a purpose. My inbox is full of people asking me why I'm doing this, but I don't think that question is really applicable to this type of activity. Many people have theorized that perhaps someone is forcing him to do this, but no, this is just performance art. Really strange performance art. But I definitely respect the dedication of the craft, for sure. Justin Carmichael, better known online as Jew Wario, was a YouTuber formerly associated with Channel Awesome. 
He was most well known for his series You Can Play This, where he reviewed and ported Japan-only video games that were still playable by those who didn't speak the language. While he wasn't a crazy popular content creator, he still frequently appeared in collaborations with the Channel Awesome crew, such as films like Kickassia and Suburban Nights. He left Channel Awesome on February 15, 2013, while still continuing to upload to his personal channel, making You Can Play This episodes. However, a year later, on January 23rd, Justin's wife had announced that he had taken his own life with a shotgun after a lengthy bout with financial troubles and depression. Several fans and content creators outpoured with support for Justin, noting how amazing of a creator and a person he's always been, and how it was an immense shock that he was even depressed at all, much less to the point of suicide. There were tons of tribute videos made in his honor, and even a heartfelt feature-length two-hour conclusion to Justin's web series Fami Kamen Writer, titled Farewell Fami Kamen Writer, produced by Channel Awesome collaborator Kaylin Saucedo, also known as Mars Girl. Fast forward a couple years later. As I've already discussed, a massive 70-page document released in 2018 titled Not So Awesome. One anonymous contributor, pseudonym Jane Doe, detailed her experience working with a Channel Awesome collaborator that she opted to not mention that had sexually abused and groomed her and other female members of the channel's fanbase. While the identity of the accused is meant to be redacted, chat logs showed that they were planning on kicking them out February 15, 2013, the exact same day that Justin had left Channel Awesome. About a week after the document released, a Reddit user posted that she had been raped by Justin in her sleep. The legitimacy of both of these claims had been verified by former Channel Awesome producers, and since that point, Ju Wario's heavily celebrated legacy had been tarnished as people learned the truth about him. As you might imagine, a person who had both committed suicide and later was known to have groomed minors is a bit difficult to talk about for really anyone. On October 15th, 2020, a gaming YouTuber by the name of Adam Butcher released a short video essay simply titled What Happened to Crow 64? It was about an obscure Nintendo 64 platformer known as Catastrophe Crow that the uploader didn't even know existed until he found it by searching through old gaming magazines from the late 1990s. The game was highly anticipated as it was developed by esteemed German game designer Manfred Lorenz, founder of Opus Interactive. It was announced at Space World 1997 and it seemed extremely promising featuring groundbreaking level design and mechanics, and was meant to push the boundaries of player experience. However, the release date got pushed back and more and more, and disgruntled employees stated that their experience of working on the game was hellish, and that Manfred simply had lost his mind, destroying himself by continuing to work on the game for years, and eventually culminated with him leaving the country altogether. He then later drowned at sea, taking the game with him. Adam Butcher then reveals that he found a copy of Catastrophe Crow on eBay, and for the latter half of the video, he plays and commentates over it. Now, the thing with all this is, is that Catastrophe Crow was never a real game, and Manfred Lorenz isn't even a real person, neither was Opus Interactive. Everything in the video had been fabricated, including the magazine pages, the GameFAQ screenshots, the Speech World footage. Everything was playing into the story that Adam Butcher had made up. While it is technically yet another gaming creepypasta, I have to say, pretending to be a video essayist is a very convincing way to do it, even if it honestly did kind of fall apart when he started showing gameplay, as it doesn't really feel like things would happen in a real cancelled game. Still, it's definitely one of the more interesting ARGs so far. On YouTube, there are a sizable amount of videos that you cannot search for with traditional means, although that makes it sound a bit creepier than it actually is. These videos use ASCII characters that YouTube's search function doesn't know how to register. Most notably of these is this video titled... <laughs> which is simply a failed Mario Kart Wii speedrun. The reason you can't search for it is because these are Japanese punctuation marks, whereas Latin ones can be searched for perfectly fine. Another example of an unsearchable video would be this one by Vsauce, titled... I think I've already gone over the idea of channels and videos that don't have a title, and all of those fall under the same umbrella, even though they're higher up on the iceberg. Kyle Myers, better known online as FPS Russia, was a YouTuber who uploaded videos about his extensive collection of firearms and explosives, mainly using them to destroy various objects. In the videos, he played a character named Dmitry Podopov, a stereotypical Russian man, complete with an exaggerated, thick accent. The channel launched in 2010, first making Call of Duty content, before shifting his focus towards the content he's known for today. By 2012, he had entered the top 10 most subscribed YouTubers of the time for uniquely tapping into humanity's innate desire to see shit blow up, that no other channel really did. His channel's future was looking pretty promising, but in the first week of 2013, something completely changed the trajectory of his career. Keith Ratliff was Kyle's friend and a member of the FPS Russia channel, who had a federal firearms license which allowed him to obtain the weapons used in the videos. Keith was found on January 3rd, 2013, shot dead in his home. They never found out who shot him, and the mystery remains unsolved to this day. 
The FBI, trying to look into who was responsible for the murder, immediately laid their eyes on the first place they could really think to go. The number one person on planet Earth associated with both firearms and Keith Ratliff, Kyle. Kyle's house was raided by upwards of 40 members of the ATF. They didn't find anything illegal, but he deleted several of his videos and went on a nine month long hiatus from the site, presumably spooked by the FBI. He returned in early 2014, although his uploads slowed quite significantly as, again, the FBI was closely monitoring everything he was doing and even threatened to raid him again if he misstepped. His channel gradually slowed to a standstill until 2016 when he stopped uploading for good. In 2017, Kyle's house was raided once more and they discovered 25 grams of hash oil. He was sent to prison for two months with two years of probation, along with nearly his entire prize collection of firearms confiscated. Today, Kyle is still seen on the Painkillers Already podcast he co-founded in 2010 with Woody's Gamertag and Wings of Redemption. Elisa Lam was a Canadian tourist staying at a hotel in downtown Los Angeles. She had been suffering from mental illness for quite some time, as she read about on her blog, and she traveled alone to California. She was assigned a couple of roommates at her hotel, but later moved on to a room of her own after her roommates complained about certain odd behavior. Then, on January 31st, Elisa Lim disappeared without a trace, and about two weeks later, LAPD released the last known footage of her before she disappeared, a surveillance camera tape of an elevator at the hotel. She's been entering and exiting the elevator while making strange gestures, and this video quickly became viral with several theories racing around as to what it means, like maybe she was hiding from an aggressor or under the influence of a drug. However, a few days later, her body was found in a water tank that provided for guest rooms, a kitchen, and a coffee shop, and the death was ruled an accidental suicide by drowning as a result of what was most likely a psychotic episode of some sort. It's only tangentially related to YouTube, but yeah, you can watch it here, I guess. On the evening of February 9th, 2004, a woman by the name of Mara Murray disappeared after a car crash on Route 112 near Haverhill, New Hampshire. No one knows what happened, and despite it happening nearly 20 years ago, no leads or even suspects have come forth. Well, actually, there was one suspect. There was this channel that started in February of 2011 that uploaded only one video titled Happy Anniversary. This video featured an elderly man sitting in front of a camera and laughing maniacally for a full minute before winking towards the camera while dramatic piano music played in the background. Now, you might be questioning questioning how these two things are related. Well, people began to connect a few things. First off, the video was uploaded almost exactly eight years after Mora had gone missing, which also ties into the title specifically mentioning an anniversary. Could just be a weird coincidence, but the channel name begs to differ. 112 Dirtbag. Mara Murray crashed her car on Route 112, and Mara Murray's father has called whoever the abductor is a dirtbag. All these things create the leading theory that the man in the video is the true aggressor of the crime, and whoever that old man is created this video to mock the family of Mara Murray. Well, the true story is a bit different. An investigation was started around the time internet users discovered this channel, and they found out that the man in the video is Massachusetts man Alden Olson. He did not kidnap Mara Murray, but unlike the High Walter video, he actually was intentionally trying to make it seem as if he was the one responsible. Why? Looking into Alden a bit deeper, he seems like an extremely mentally ill, possibly paranoid schizophrenic person, and is obsessed with the Mara Murray case. He has his own blog where he exclusively talks about the case, spouting off strange theories, and a lot of his posts appear to be taunting James Renner, an investigative journalist who got in the case around the same time that the happy anniversary was posted. Apparently, according to this blog post I found, Olsen was also arrested in 2007 for threatening to murder his brother and sister, although at this point I'm getting completely off track. At the end of the day, 112 Dirtbag was just some creepy old guy who felt like fucking with people in a sick and twisted way. Monkey Jones, now known as Simeon Jimmy, is a YouTuber who is quite controversial among most users of the site. He's been uploading since 2007 when he was only 12 years old, however he didn't really gain popularity until 2016 with the birth of his channel, Monkey Jones. His content was expectedly edgy given the time period, and he gained a considerable following because of it. He had series such as Monkey's Declassified Survival Guide, Monkey's Anime Reviews, Is It Kino, and most famously, his video series where he talks about and mocks mass murderer Elliot Roger. The videos, if taken to face value, seem to feature Monkey praising Elliot Roger's actions, however it becomes quite obvious that the videos are sarcastic mockeries of his ideologies. YouTube staff didn't get the joke, however, and in December of 2018, Monkey's YouTube account was terminated on the basis that his content was hate speech. He tried coming back a couple times, but every single time, his channel just kept getting terminated. Many saw it as a manifestation of YouTube censoring things that don't really need to be censored. It seems he's back on YouTube now though, on the channel Simeon Jimmy. 
Austin Jones was a musician on YouTube who began posting as far back as 2007, when he was only 15, doing covers of popular songs, and soon branched out to producing EPs and albums. However, nowadays, that isn't exactly what he's known for. In 2015, Austin Jones messaged one of his fans, an underage girl, convincing her to do a video twerking for him. The girl responded, saying that she didn't know how to twerk, and asked him to show her. He then sent her a personal video tutorial by him on how to do the dance move. She did not follow the tutorial, and instead posted publicly on Twitter for the world to see. A horde of justifiably angry fans lashed out at Austin, leading him to outright beg the girl to delete the post, not like it would help him, because he was going to go on tour very soon. She refused, and this led to an apology video titled Setting the Record Straight, where he tries his absolute hardest to make people feel bad for him. First, he admits that it's all true, and that he did ask his underage fans for twerking videos. Then he immediately shifts topics about how shitty his life is, talking about how his parents divorced, he planned suicide at one point, his father was an alcoholic, his older sister passed away, he never saw his mother, all this shit that was most likely genuinely very hard to deal with, assuming it's true. But of course he was using these things to distract from the main issue at hand. He's a fucking pedophile. Of course, his fans completely bought his apology, and he continued uploading YouTube videos while still facing overwhelming support from his fanbase. Then, two years later, in 2017, he was arrested for possession and assisting in the production of child pornography, sentenced to 10 years in prison to absolutely no one's surprise. Life of Luxury is a horror YouTube series that started in 2019. The video's plots usually revolve around two friends, Parker and Chester, as they go to the homes of victims of hauntings and otherwise supernatural occurrences. The most popular of their videos is Her Son Can't Stop Growing at Night, which features a lady that reports her son has weird growths at night that cause them to look like this monster, and he gains aggressive behavior. These videos are quite obviously fake, but the production value is still higher than your average 3AM YouTuber. Haunt is a stop-motion horror short film released on YouTube all the way back in 2006, created by British film student Glenn Zimator. It's about four minutes long, and the plot basically follows this young girl going to bed. She then looks out her window and sees a mysterious figure standing there. It gradually gets closer to her throughout the rest of the video, before it's finally revealed at the end that the figure is now inside her house. It enters a room with a brief jump scare in the final seconds, and that's where the video ends. Surprisingly, I don't have much else to say on this one, but you should check out this video by a severely underrated YouTuber I found named Jack the Artisan if you want to learn more about the production of the video. Link, as always, in the description. Paranormal Lana was a YouTuber who joined in 2014. She primarily made horror content, such as videos about real-life events, spooky stories, paranormal events, and other things of that nature. And she was most well-known for a video about the Eliza Lamb situation. She was fairly popular, however, in 2015, she disappeared without a trace. She deleted all of her social media accounts, including YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Even Rainbot, a fellow content creator who was planning on doing a collaboration video with Alana, had no idea where she went. However, after looking through her old tweets, we can find that she was dealing with a stalker, so the most likely explanation is that she gave up her online identity to avoid said stalker, which is unfortunately more common than you might think. Unfavorable Semicircle is a channel that was created in 2015. They began uploading in April of that year, and when I say uploaded, they fucking uploaded. At its peak, the channel uploaded two to three videos every two minutes. While the channel was still active, tens of thousands of videos were posted, most of which were only a few seconds long, but some were as long as 11 hours. Almost all the videos featured strange abstract imagery, an unidentified voice saying a letter or number, and random blasts of loud noise. The title was always the Sagittarius ASCII symbol, followed by a random six-digit code. Parallels might have already been drawn in your mind to Semicircle's older brother, Webdarver Torso, which exists around the same time frame. However, as it would turn out, there's no real familial ties, if you catch my drift. Unfavorable Semicircle, as fate would have it, actually had no ties to YouTube or Google, and instead was just an unidentified person uploading these videos. A small subreddit started soon after people noticed the channel, in order to investigate and speculate into the channel's origins. Hell, the channel even got the attention of mainstream media outlets such as BBC, CNET, and Atlas Obscura. However, on February 25th, 2016, the Unfavorable Semicircle account was suspended for terms of service violations, more specifically, their policy against spam. So what, they're allowed to do it, but we're not? Since it's doubtful that YouTube would terminate its own channel, this outright confirmed that it was something a bit more interesting than Mr. Torso over here. Further investigation into these strange videos revealed some hidden details that later expanded into, you guessed it, another ARG. Unfavorable semicircle lore runs pretty deep, with the true identity of the creator remaining a mystery. However, nowadays it seems to be over, and who I assume to be the creator, posted this to Twitter in 2022 with a post titled 
answers. The post goes in depth on the intentions of the project and that breaking it down as simply as possible, it was meant to feel as inhuman and confusing as possible. What's interesting about this post is that while the unfavorable semicircle community seems to agree that this really is the creator, I couldn't find a single video on YouTube that mentions this. Maybe I'm the first. Pop Blast was a YouTube channel that had nearly 700,000 subscribers before it was terminated. The channel, from what I can gather, seemed to be a strange content farm channel that created false conspiracy theories about fellow content creators and other celebrities, in an effort to gain attention and money from the YouTube algorithm. They became most famous in 2018 for their video accusing Shane Dawson of being a pedophile using Splice podcast clips as evidence, and notably saying that two of his significant others have baby faces. Now, now pause. Shane Dawson's definitely fucking weird. When people talk about the Pop Blast situation, they bring up how the clips were spliced up, but really I can't see a situation where these are okay things to say. In the clips, he talks about how masturbating to images of children shouldn't be vilified and compares it to foot fetishes. He also remarks that he met a six-year-old one time that he thought was kind of sexy. This channel was kind of ahead of its time because two years later, Shane Dawson was slain by the YouTube community for many other comments that surfaced, but that's a whole separate controversy and I'm getting off track. Pop Blast, after posting this video, released a series of strange videos once they started getting attention. These videos would feature strange codes with hidden messages in them that seemed to be them saying that they were paid $6,500 to make the Shane Dawson video by a man named Jeffrey Oscar Levin, which is the name of Logan Paul's manager. Realistically though, that was probably faked and whoever was running this channel was probably doing anything they could to cause as much outrage as possible before they got their channel taken down. I believe this entry refers to videos where people re-upload emergency alert systems, more commonly the ones broadcast on TV, ranging from several different countries, such as the EAS we have in the States, the Canadian Alert Ready system, and many more. These are usually characterized by random, unwarned interruptions of broadcasts, loud beeping sounds, and a low-quality voice recording of a stern voice telling you that something has gone wrong. These emergency alerts often fascinate certain parts of YouTube in a way that could be compared to anti-piracy screens. Something about the fact that it interrupts everything without warning to play a loud noise because something bad happens and just makes people so invested in these. Hell, some people even make fake emergency alerts like anti-piracy screens for similar reasons. Local 58, which I've mentioned a couple times, is pretty much entirely preying off the fear of these, as are several other analog horror web series. Emergency alerts always spooked me a bit more than the anti-piracy screens, because I'm pretty sure I've literally seen some of these before in an obscured, hazy childhood memory. Christina Grimmie, sometimes known online as ZeldaXLove64, was a singer, YouTuber, and actress. She got her start in 2009 posting covers of songs to YouTube, and from there she would gain more and more attention as time went on. She was a contestant on season 6 of The Voice, which got her recognition from big time musicians such as Adam Levine and Lil Wayne, who both offered to sign her to their record labels. She released two studio albums in 2013 and 2017, several EPs and singles, and her YouTube channel was flourishing as well. It would seem Christina had a pretty promising career ahead of her, but as fate would have it, that would be cut short. In 2016, in Orlando, Florida, she performed live at the Live Plaza Theater. After the performance, she held a meet and greet around 10 p.m. Then she was fatally shot by a man by the name of Kevin James Loibel after she opened her arms to give him a hug, before committing suicide himself. Apparently, according to police investigation, Loibel had an unhealthy and unrealistic infatuation with Christina, and would vainly attempt to make himself more physically attractive with things like weight loss, hair plugs, and eye surgery, even though up to this point, he had never directly interacted with each other. He then developed the mentality of, if I can't have you, no one can, which tragically led to the end of her life. The news broke the hearts of many of her friends, family, and fans, all who saw her with an incredibly bright future. Gemini Home Entertainment is an analog horror web series started in 2019 by Remy Abode. The series has a similar aesthetic to many others in its genre, taking place in the 1980s and 90s, and visually presents itself as a collection of VHS tapes produced by several fictional companies and distributed by the company Gemini Home Entertainment. These VHS tapes can range from commercials, home videos, public service announcements, and many other things. While these videos all usually stand on their own, it leads up to one big narrative of essentially the impending end of the world through extraterrestrial invaders that are significantly stronger than us humans. Through the series, they're only planning the invasion, but at the same time influencing life on Earth. If you can't tell by that two and a half hour long Nexpo video, shit runs pretty deep. I'll link said video in the description, as well as a playlist of all the episodes so you can watch it for yourself. It's one of the best analog horror series out there. The Maker is an award-winning stop-motion short film written and directed by Christopher Cazellos. It stars this strange, rabbit-looking guy as he stitches together what appears to be a female member of his species. 
As he's doing this, he's constantly looking over at this hourglass, which is going down fast. Then, he finally finishes her and the time runs out, and he fades away, implying her to start the cycle all over again. I love this shit, the visuals are unsettling but appealing, and the twist at the end is great. Not much else to say about this one, it's just a really great short. Pizza Time Pizza is a web series created by Alex Bale, started in 2017. It follows a pizza restaurant called Pizza Time Pizza that's certainly not a cult or anything, just a family restaurant. The first video is what seems to be a parody of pizza commercials, although near the end of the video, the camera zooms out to someone eating the advertised pizza, then collapsing to the floor with the words kill your parents repeating over and over again. After that, the series branched out into 15 main videos, each building up to, you guessed it, an ARG. It included a couple secret videos, bumping the real count up to 44 and a separate website. You know the drill by this point, explanation video in the description, this time by Inside a Mind. This may or may not come as a surprise to some of you, but I fucking love the YouTube comment section. There's something about it that just feels so much different compared to basically any other social media. Maybe because it's decentralized, for lack of a better term, so there's no real average YouTube commenter. When you think of the average Twitter post, or the average Reddit post, or even the average 4chan post, you get a pretty idea in your head of what that's like. However, with YouTube comments, you can really get fucking anything. Some of my favorite posts are from going on, like, Friday Night Funkin' videos and looking at the comment section to see what the little kids have to say about their favorite mods. Another example of what I'm talking about is the now-defunct internet checkpoints, where people would leave life updates on Japanese uploads of Super Nintendo music. That's a great example of a comment section journal, however, it's far from the only example on YouTube. In the comment section of this specific upload of Claire de Lune, you can find a user by the name of Mr. Tortilla. He has been using the comment section as his diary for the past two and a half years or so and doesn't seem to show any sign of stopping. You can go to the comment section right now, sort by newest, and find a comment by Mr. Tortilla that's most likely posted no later than 24 hours ago. And this isn't even the only example of this, as he's inspired several other users in the comment section to start their own diaries. While researching, I also found this commenter on Porter Robinson's shelter, named Just Jeff, who's been going for nearly four years and possibly started the trend. It's a really interesting trend, and it just makes the YouTube comment section that much more comfier. BreadTube, also known as LeftTube, is a loose group of YouTubers who create content relating to a generally left-wing political perspective. The community doesn't have an attributed origin date, but it rose to popularity as a way to combat the far-right anti-SJW movement that was quite popular in the mid-2010s. The idea was that they would take back the algorithm from the far-right guys I was talking about in the last video. Popular BreadTube content creators include HBomberGuy, ContraPoints, Sean, Hassan Piker, Destiny, and Vouch who I don't like because he appropriated Conti from Fully Cooley by sticking his face on top of him. That's not related to anything, I just wanted to express my grievances. BreadTubers usually have significantly high production value to their videos. Now, some of these people have done questionable things, so I'm not going to get super in-depth about this one, as that's a political rabbit hole I don't really feel like going down. Nico Nico Doga is something I've covered a couple times over the course of the past, like, two tiers. But if you need a recap, it's basically a Japanese equivalent to YouTube that's peaked around the mid to late 2000s and early 2010s. A couple entries we've talked about so far find their origins on this side of the internet, including Yankat, Caramel Dancing, Ronald McDonald Insanity, Bad Apple, and any Toho related thing on YouTube for that matter. And Nico Nico Doga, much like YouTube, also has its fair share of creepy videos and stuff like that. There are of course the disturbing Vocaloid songs that I've already covered, usually complete with disturbing Vocaloid imagery, and a video titled SM666, which is a video where a user tries to go to a Nico Nico channel simply titled 666, and it returns no results. They tried refreshing, and eventually they find the channel, and everything is red and creepy, and... Uh... W w wait a second. Yeah, it turns out username 666 was actually not the original version of this video, and instead it was the localized western version made by the same person. I didn't even know this when I first covered username 666 earlier in the series. It's kind of embarrassing. Pot of Plant himself also recommended I talk about this video titled Yuru Yuri Opening 2, which seems to be a bait and switch upload of the second opening of an anime titled Yuru Yuri. It starts out normally, but then this girl is doing the weird face, and then by the end they're all doing this weird face, and yeah, it's pretty freaky. At the end of the day, though, I have a hunch that a lot of Nico Nico Doga videos were probably considered a lot more creepy than they really were, because Americans weren't used to Japan's unique brand of weirdness yet. 
Logan was a YouTube channel that would comment on the videos of smaller content creators, simply asking, wanna be friends? This account is a spam bot, and for a short time in 2020, you couldn't escape it. Basically every new video had this wanna be friends thing posted on it. These comments appear normal at first, but upon closer inspection, this is one of YouTube's greatest security breaches. Interacting with this comment or channel at all would put you in danger of losing your account. Subscribing to it puts you in danger, replying to it puts you in danger, liking the comment puts you in danger. The actual channel itself is definitely pretty sus. This brand new gaming commentary channel started up and immediately got a hundred thousand views on a welcome to my channel video. All of the comments are obviously bought and staying stuff like hi, great video, or stuff like that. But if you went to the actual channels of the commenters, these were real channels held by real people. The strange thing is that clicking on the channel will sometimes lead you to other channels, like this one called Tribby and this one called Vaxi. Luckily, it seems that YouTube has found some kind of fix for this as it doesn't seem to show up anymore. People Ruin Everything is simply the side channel of a significantly more popular YouTuber, Elvis the Alien. On People Ruin Everything, he goes over certain franchises like Undertale, Minecraft, Sonic the Hedgehog, and talks about why these things were ruined by their fan bases. And that's pretty much it. I can't give much reason why this is even on the iceberg. I guess it did stop uploading two years ago, but he still uploads to his main channel, so uh... Yeah. Jordan Go to Sleep, also known as Jordan Underneath, is a content creator who formerly did video essays about video games and stuff like that. However, in 2017, his content shifted towards something he felt represented himself far better. These live action, surrealist animations that feature music made entirely by him. One of his most notable videos, and the one that Iceberg mentioned specifically, is called Feel Good Today, where a talking dinosaur gives the viewer and this blue creature therapy, introducing himself as a certified therapist and one of the highest names in the mental health field. The video, along with a lot of Jordan's other videos, are very very unsettling despite the subject matter not being anything too crazy. I'd recommend checking some of those videos out. Normally, as you most likely know, when you're watching an ad on YouTube, the progress bar is typically yellow and then goes back to red when the ad ends. However, sometimes the color won't change and you'll just have a yellow progress bar on a normal video. That's all there really is to this one, just a weird little glitch that got resolved pretty quickly. Shima Luan was a member of Super Planet Dolan, an animated Q&A show starring former Top 10 creator Danger Dolan. The series had a wide cast of characters, but the main two were the creator Dolan and Shima, who was represented with a pink cat furry. In 2016, she disappeared from the channel, stating in an email that the job was too stressful, along with certain family issues. This reasoning was not revealed until, like, December of last year, so everyone was clearly worried in those six years. Some people thought she had passed away, others thought she had a stalker, some people even thought she couldn't take all the people sexualizing her character, which I'd hazard to guess is probably at least a factor. They discussed it briefly on live streams and side channels and stuff like that, saying they also haven't heard anything from Shima in those years, and all they knew was that she was okay because they see her Steam notifications going off sometimes. They finally uploaded a main video in December 2022, where they explained what happened to Shima, and yeah, again, family issues and anxiety, basically. Okay, bear with me for a second. Apollo Legend was a YouTuber who joined in 2016, and from there he would upload several videos about speedrunning. His most popular video by far was one titled Top 10 Speedrunners Who Are Caught Cheating, where he covers famous examples of, well, speedrunners who are caught cheating. Past this point, nearly all of his content revolved around cheating scandals in the community, including some that he would even investigate himself, such as Todd Rogers and infamous Donkey Kong record holder Billy Mitchell, who wasn't exactly happy that Apollo would criticize him. Billy Mitchell did what he's known for and filed a $1 million lawsuit against Apollo, but they reached a settlement where he would simply have to take down all his videos about him. After that, Apollo got himself into more drama with Dark Viper AU. In 2018, Apollo Legend uploaded a video criticizing Games Done Quick for banning our white goose for being a literal white supremacist, and Dark Viper AU would upload a video criticizing for this. This resulted in a feud between the two. Two years later, Apollo would attack Dark Viper for not paying a TikTok editor, and then Dark Viper responded by saying he didn't pay them because they didn't do an acceptable job, and that Apollo was simply attacking him because he held a two-year grudge against Dark Viper because he called him out for defending an ethno-nationalist. Then Apollo responded by making a video called This Speedrunner Thinks I'm Scum, which many saw as a ploy to get attention. He would lose a lot of subscribers for this, and many would migrate to Dark Viper's channel. Then another YouTuber named Easyscape would upload a video explaining the situation, describing his own experiences with Apollo being leech-like. Then on New Year's Eve 2020, Apollo would upload a video to his second channel, describing how shitty he's at it for basically his entire life, citing mental health issues that go back as far as five years old. He also called out Dark Viper and Easyscape by name, stating that their drama had only made everything worse. 
This video would later be found out to be a suicide note, as Apollo would take his own life hours after its upload. This is a strange situation, to say the least. The suicide was obviously a tragedy, as any suicide is. People weren't really fond of the whole citing specific people in your suicide note over petty video game speedrunning drama. I can't really imagine how it must have felt for the two people mentioned. The Catalonian Fallen Angel is a viral video posted as far back as 2006 of two Spanish dudes wandering through the forest at night following a trail of feathers. They then discover this creature. It seems to be a humanoid, anorexic figure that's just kind of sitting there. The creature then looks at the camera suddenly, and that's pretty much where the video ends. This video likes to resurface every so often. In 2006, it was a Fallen Angel video. In 2013, it was The Rake. And recently, it's been considered a Skinwalker. The thing is, though, it was debunked years ago on a site called FallenAngelMakingOf.com, which no longer exists, and the internet archive doesn't seem to work for it. However, on the website for the studio that produced this video, Coco Bongo Artworks, we can find a 3D VR experience created for the video's 10th anniversary. That's fun. The SCP Foundation, if you're not aware, is a collaborative writing project held on a wiki of the same name that's about these strange creatures that exist in a fictional world. You probably already know that, but I thought I'd bring it up anyways for thoroughness's sake. Anyways, SCP movies basically just refer to fanmade productions that adapt certain stories from this wiki into short films. You can find a couple of these on YouTube, like the several of them that have been made by YouTubers like Mr. Clay and Evan Royal. Marina Joyce is a British content creator who joined in 2010 that makes videos such as beauty tutorials, vlogs, and basically whatever she feels like making. She got quite popular from her eccentric personality, and in a few years she would reach 1 million subscribers. However, around 2016, her channel's content was noted by fans to be a bit strange. She acted erratically, and some people even thought she seemed scared or on drugs possibly, or even forced to make videos against her will. She would flinch at certain things like cars going by, and she had become noticeably skinnier as time went on. This would worry fans to the point of starting a campaign titled Hashtag Save Marina Joyce. Investigative fans found more evidence that she was in danger, such as an Instagram comment from someone who had met her that stated she saw her surrounded by some creepy looking guys, or of old photos of herself covered in bruises. Some users found silhouetted men in the reflections of her eyes. She dispelled the theories a couple times on her various social media accounts, but many fans didn't buy it, as they believed Marina's account was hacked or compromised. On July 26, she randomly tweeted out to meet her at Bethnal Green at 6.30am for a party, and that you should bring a friend. This was kind of random, and shocked a lot of people as it was very much in the heat of the moment. Some theories even stated that this would be a terrorist attack led by ISIS. The whole thing had so much quote-unquote evidence of Marina being kidnapped or otherwise in trouble, even if a lot of it was just the largest stretch ever or literally just faked. The situation eventually came to a close when the local police department finally said that she's okay and perfectly fine. All in all, the whole situation was simply a case of mass hysteria, not dissimilar to many other cases throughout history, such as those clown sightings that happened literally three months later. Listen, 2016 was a rough year. The Marina Joyce situation was kind of ridiculous and serves as a prime example of how far things can get if enough people believe it. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the main inspiration for the Kate Yup thing, assuming that's an ARG. The sheer number of quote-unquote pieces of evidence that were brought up and later debunked is staggering, so I'll link a video by Gamer from Mars in the description. So remember how I talked about how much I loved the YouTube comment section with the whole journals thing? And then immediately followed it up with one of the most powerful botnets the site has seen? Well let's dial it back a bit and talk about another fun thing about the YouTube comment section. Children. You see, YouTube is the favorite app of little kids because they get their poppy's playtime Minecraft friendly funk and content streams sent directly to their synapses, and while sometimes they comment on videos. A great example of this comes from Walter Clements, a YouTube user who commented on well, I couldn't find what video it was on, but the screenshot surfaced around 2016. The comment reads, I like fire trucks and moisture trucks. I'm going to assume that the video the comment was on actually had nothing to do with fire trucks whatsoever. He then replies to his own comment simply saying, Walter. I couldn't tell you why this is so funny, but it just is. I Hate Everything is a YouTuber who is most well known for a series of the same name, where he discusses a particular piece of media and talks about why he hates it, like I hate the Emoji Movie, I hate Big Mouth, I hate Damn Daniel, I hate Watch Mojo, etc, etc. I Hate Everything is a pretty standard channel that doesn't really have any controversy to talk about besides when some fans of a thing don't like that he made a video on their favorite thing. Now, the weird thing about I Hate Everything is the fans of the channel. 
Since IAG presents himself as a cynical hater of things that are for the most part internet trends or memes, they generate some inside jokes that are exactly what he's saying he hates. In the I Hate Damn Daniel video, he said that the meme is the equivalent of pointing at a plant and going, der plant. This made der plant a phrase that he would literally never hear the end of. This is exemplified even further when you look at the trend of I Hate Everything fan slash parody channels. There are a ridiculous amount of these. I love everything. I care about everything. I build everything, I'm neutral on everything, I'm undecided on everything, I fuck everything, <laughs> I slap my genitalia on everything, I chin everything, I have a slight aversion of everything, I re-upload everything, I burn everything, I possess everything, I crap everything, I hate literally everything, I trump everything, and I hate the teriyaki chicken sandwich from Subway. It just keeps going and going and going and going. And you click on these videos and it's the most brainless, mind-numbing content imaginable, with them more often than not using text-to-speech rather than their actual voice. Which of course there's nothing wrong with that, one of my favorite YouTubers actually exclusively uses text-to-speech, but definitely not in the way that these channels do. I can't even really tell where these channels started or ended, although I'd imagine it stems from I Hate Everything just being a very malleable username. These channels even seem to get into their own little dramas and beef as time went on, which is really interesting. IG even did a video on his main channel called I Hate Weird Parody Channels, where he goes over several of the channels and judges whether he likes or dislikes them. These were definitely one of the strangest trends on YouTube. Darkside Phil, commonly abbreviated to simply DSP, is a gaming YouTuber who has been on the site since 2008, although his currently used channel was created in 2010. Since his debut, he's gained a respectable 200,000 subscribers, and has uploaded nearly 60,000 videos to his channel. For reference, that's roughly a dozen videos uploaded daily for the past 12 years, and that doesn't even include multiple side channels. He's rather infamous for a whole host of reasons, mainly stemming from his susceptibility to being trolled, and also him just kind of being bad at video games. Really bad at video games. You see, Darkside Phil's fanbase does not originate from him being funny, or good at video games, or anything like that. People watch him because nearly every time he plays a game, he's terrible at it, and every single time he fails, he blames it on basically anything that isn't himself, which has earned him the title the King of Hate. He first earned this nickname in the early 2000s when he was still a Super Street Fighter 2 professional player, where his biggest claim to fame was getting fourth at EVO on an inferior part of the game. If you look up DSP on YouTube, you won't find his channel, at least not immediately. Instead, you'll find other content creators making commentary videos, video essays, or compilations of stupid moments from his video and streams. Most famous of these is the This Is How You Don't Play series, where people do the Herculean task of watching a DSP playthrough and highlight every time he fucks up while playing a game, which is a series that's been around since 2013, with This Is How You Don't Play MGS2 being the first one. He often says that the whole bad at video games thing is simply part of his comedic persona, that he could be good at video games if he really wanted to. Of course, he's also said that he has no gimmick and that he's the realest person on YouTube, so there's not really any way of knowing which one's the truth. He's gotten into feuds with several other YouTubers and is almost constantly in financial trouble due to the lifestyle of sitting around and streaming video games all the time. However, possibly his biggest fuck up, and if you have any prior knowledge about this guy, the clear elephant in the room that I haven't gotten to yet was, as the iceberg puts it, the infamous masturbation stream. In 2016, Phil was doing a pre-stream and thought he shut the camera off. However, he didn't. Viewers got a full look at him choking his chicken on stream. You can't see any explicit bits, but you can very clearly tell what he's up to. This is a blunder that DSP will never live down, even to this day, as that's usually the first thing anyone brings up when talking about him. That's gotta suck. DSP over the years has become one of the most mocked figures on the internet, rivaled only by the likes of Chris Chan. If you want more info on the DSP saga, check out the Down the Rabbit Hole episode on him. Around the tail end of 2020, two things were very popular with the YouTube algorithm. Mukbang videos and Friday Night Funkin'. A lot of strange animation channels that may or may not be run by AI saw both of these circulating around, and thus a trend was created. Friday Night Funkin' Mukbang videos, where several characters from the game, as well as popular mods, eat a bunch of food. These videos are bewildering, to say the least. Why are there so fucking many of them, and why do they all have millions upon millions of views? I guess it's literally just combining two things that are algorithmically popular, but wh who's clicking on these videos? Alex Jones is someone I'm sure you've probably heard of before. Conspiracy theorist, host of Infowars, Sandy Hook truther, thinks the governments are turning the frogs gay. You know, I really don't need to introduce him. In 2018, YouTube removed four videos off the Alex Jones channel, citing them as a violation of long-standing policies against child endangerment and hate speech. 
YouTube also issued a strike against the channel, meaning that they were not allowed to livestream for the next 90 days. This is the catalyst that brought other content platforms to move as content, such as Facebook, iTunes, and Spotify. Alex Jones would then try to sneak back onto YouTube using an alternative account, which went against YouTube's policy on ban evasion, leading to all of his accounts to be terminated. This is obviously a very controversial event on both sides, as while some people believe this act to be infringing on his god-given right to push hate speech, others were upset at YouTube for not doing this sooner. Derek Savage is the infamous creator of Cool Cat Saves the Kids, a direct-to-video educational film that was created to teach kids about bullying and the dangers of firearms. The movie gained infamy when YouTube reviewers such as Your Movie Sucks and I Hate Everything reviewed, criticizing the movie for being generally terrible on all accounts. Unlike someone like Tommy Wiseau, maybe, who rolled with the punches, Daddy Derek wasn't very fond of people making reviews shitting on his intellectual masterpiece. This would lead to possibly one of the most egregious cases of copyright claim abuse in YouTube's lifespan. He would not only copyright claim videos, but attack reviewers personally, threatening legal action if they don't take down the videos, and even pretending to be law firms in order to intimidate them. The Derek Savage Cool Cat saga is long and winding, so I'll just recommend you... No, that one's too long. Watch this one instead. Angry Video Game Nerd, as I talked about in Tier 3, has a legacy that can't really be overstated. He was essentially the pioneer of the guy reviews video games with skits interspersed throughout genre of YouTube reviews that's extremely common to this day. JonTron, Peanut Butter Gamer, Scott the Waz, Angry Joe, they all find their ancestral roots in one common link. However, back in AVGN's prime though, people were a lot less subtle with their inspirations. There are a couple of infamous cases of this, I fucking love these guys. Irate Gamer is probably the most famous of these, as he was probably the closest to emulating the AVGN style, production quality-wise. He received a lot of backlash from what was clearly him in making the format, and his videos were generally considered to be significant inferior in terms of humor and quality. The Irate Gamer ditched this style of content sometime in the 2010s and is known today as the Gamer from Mars. That's completely untrue, by the way. I just lied for no reason. I'm sorry. Another AVGN I'm particularly a fan of is the pissed off angry hardcore gamer, a Russian creator who reviewed games and consoles he didn't like, kinda like the angry video game nerd. I've often seen him called the internet's worst video game critic, and his reviews kinda live up to that title. He would often do most of the review in a slow, monotonous voice, and then the red eyes would show up and he'd start screaming. And when I put in the shitbox 360, it fucked it all up, so all done. Pretty cool guy. The most interesting one of these was the Game Dude, who had the funniest intro theme of all the AVGN clones. Game Dude overtly stated in his title screens that he was inspired by the nerd, or Nerd-spired, as he would say. Good one. The reason why this one is the most interesting one, though, is something that runs a bit deeper than just the shitty videos on the internet, that I think I'm gonna save for the Honorable Mentions video. I don't think I really need to explain this one that much. Porn bots are basically just comment bots that will sometimes pose as sexy women, or men, no judging, and post links to adult content. These links will, most of the time, not actually be real adult content, and instead be some kind of phishing scam where you give them your credit card information or something. It would seem like there was a large influx of these around 2021, but these are a thing on pretty much every corner of the internet. SS Sniper Wolf is a YouTuber with 30 million subscribers who does reaction videos, commentary, vlogs, and gaming videos. While Potted Plant admitted to me, he put her here in error, not realizing how popular she was due to him living in Asia. There's an interesting event that happened pretty recently that I feel like I could talk about. In late 2021, a 10-year-old girl was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and her wish was to meet Sniper Wolf. And then, I guess she ghosted the mother of the girl, then Keemstar got involved and told her off. She deflected the criticism. Then he posted this video to Twitter, and he was really angry. You know, this situation is kind of convoluted, and I can't really tell who was right or wrong, but yeah, it's the best I could find for SS Sniper Wolf. Badabun is a Mexican YouTube channel which is run by the Badabun Network, a major network for the Spanish-speaking side of YouTube, tied in with several large content creators. The channel itself has around 46 million subscribers and is the third most subscribed Spanish-speaking YouTube channel behind Hola Soy German and El Reno Infantil. 
It's always the fucking baby channels, man. Over time, Badaboon has had its fair share of controversies. There's the Ola Soy German versus Badaboon subscriber battle, which seems to me like the Spanish version of T-Series versus PewDiePie. There's also apparently accusations thrown around of sexual harassment, homophobia, and labor exploitations at the company. However, the reason I knew about this channel before making the iceberg, despite not being a Spanish speaker, is their ridiculously terrible fake speedrun of Super Mario Bros. In 2017, they uploaded a video where one of their creators, Tava and Betancourt, speedran the game, and yeah, the footage is basically spliced from several other top-level speedruns, as well as tasks, performing some inputs which aren't even possible for a human. This resulted in a video by Carl Jobs three years later, which led Badabun to get a whole lot of criticism. Star Man is a YouTube channel with over 17 million subscribers. The videos on this channel usually feature scripted skits where the characters learn a moral lesson by the end. They're pretty basic lessons and they're usually considered kinda corny. Again, this is another entry that Potaplant told me he put here in error, and also told me to make fun of him in the video for putting them here, so... Uh... Fuck you for not being American, I guess. I suppose there was the whole protest Darman thing that happened three days ago as of writing this script, where several actors came forward and said they're not being paid properly, and that most of them live in poverty, and apparently the man himself dodges employees when they asked about pay. So that's fun. CJ So Cool is a YouTuber with about 8 million subscribers who used to do reaction videos like his brother Jinx. However, nowadays he does skits and vlogs and stuff like that. I believe why he's here in the first place is one particular incident. In 2016, he uploaded a video where he pranked his kids by feeding them laxatives. This got about the reaction that you'd expect, with many people immediately criticizing him for being a terrible parent and abusing his kids. The video was not even up for 24 hours before YouTube took it down as a violation of community guidelines, and CJ's channel was also temporarily suspended. Surprisingly enough, though, his channel nowadays seems to be doing fine. JayStation was one of those 3AM YouTubers I was talking about in, like, the second tier, maybe. His videos feel almost AI-generated despite the fact that they're live-action recordings. Buying a girlfriend off the deep web at 3AM. Haunted Elmo doll Ouija board at 3am, Sonic.exe homunculus, calling Alan from Daisy Brown on FaceTime. Man, he really knows how to mix and match shit that's on the first four tiers of this iceberg, huh? JayStation is oftentimes considered the worst YouTuber on the platforms for a staggering number of reasons, not just his content being shitty, so let's run through all of them quickly. In 2018, following the Logan Paul Suicide Forest controversy, Jay uploaded a video where he went to the Suicide Forest overnight at 3am, gone wrong, gone sexual. Of course, the video was fake, just like all his other videos. He didn't actually go to the Suicide Forest, but it's still weird that he would even make a video like this in the first place, seemingly leeching off a popular trend, even though Logan Paul nearly lost his whole career for doing the exact same thing. Jason has also been known to use celebrities' deaths as a means to clickbait. Eight days after the murder of XXXTentacion, Jason uploaded a video titled XXXTentacion Ouija Board Challenge at 3am, gone wrong. Two days after the death of Mac Miller, Jason uploaded a video titled RIP Mac Miller Spirit Box Challenge at 3am, speaks about Ariana Grande. Finally, the one he got possibly the most criticism for was a video uploaded mere hours after Etika's passing, where he does the same thing, he uses a real-life death as a creepypasta hero brine sighting shit. In the same video, he even talks about Etika, saying that if you don't have it as bad as he did, you're not actually depressed, and that you should suck it up, effectively not only insulting a dead man's honor, but also literally every viewer that suffers from depression. He also criticized YouTubers who made tribute videos to Etika, saying that they're monetizing a man's death, despite the fact that the video was monetized. He deleted the video, but yeah, people were never going to forgive him after that. Not like it really changed at all, because a year later he would go on to make a video where he sits in front of a camera and explains with teary eyes that his girlfriend Alexia had passed away in a car accident, that he was heartbroken. Five days later, he would upload a video titled Dead Girlfriend Ouija Board Challenge at 3am Gone Wrong. You cannot make this shit up. Turns out his girlfriend wasn't actually dead, and it was all for the content. She then came forward soon after and talked about how he was very abusive to her and that they had a very unhealthy relationship, which, I mean, no shocker there. All of this is only a quick run-through of the nasty shit JayStation has gotten himself into over the years, and if you want a more in-depth look, then check out The Worst YouTuber of All Time by Nerd City and Colossal is Crazy. It has some very high production value and is well worth the hour-long runtime. Shadbase. Oh god, where to begin? This is the YouTube account of an infamous artist known as Shadman. He's not particularly known for his YouTube channel, more sticking to his website, also called Chadbase, but he does maintain a pretty substantial 300,000 subscribers. He's a Rule 34 artist, although he's a bit edgier than your average Coomer. The big thing is that he really, really likes lollies, which, if you're not familiar, is pornographical art of underage anime or cartoon characters. 
Now, this is already disturbing, disgusting, reprehensible, and degenerate as is, but Shadman kind of goes a bit further beyond, drawing porn of real-life children. He's drawn suggestive art of Lieutenant Corbus, for example, who was a commentary YouTuber at the time was 11 years old. In 2016, he promised that if Donald Trump won the election, he would draw suggestive art of Keemstar's then 7-year-old daughter. Which happened. He also drew art of 12-year-old child actor Daphne Keene, resulting in a cease and desist order from her lawyers. He's also had some non-child porn related controversies, one example being that on Mother's Day he drew porn of his own real-life mother. Another example is that about a day after the passing of Ed Gould, the creator of Ed's World, Shadman would draw art of his character getting raped by the Grim Reaper? Hell, even one look at his avatar can tell you this guy is a complete and utter edgelord. The crazy thing is that he is incredibly popular and that many popular content creators would willingly associate with him, despite both sides of the political spectrum hating his guts. In 2021, Shadman would be arrested in Los Angeles for... assault with a deadly weapon, which is not the crime I was expecting him to be charged with. Elliot Roger was a man living in Isla Vista, California, who was dealing with mental health issues. He ran a YouTube channel that's since been deleted where he uploaded vlogs about how he couldn't get girls and how life was unfair. You know, standard incel shit. In 2014, he would go on to kill three students in his apartment complex by stabbing them to death. He then drove his car to a sorority house where he would shoot three women, killing two of them. Finally, he would drive his car through the town, striking people with his vehicle and shooting more people with his firearm. He would then finally die from a self-inflicted gunshot. In total, six people lost their lives that day, not including Roger himself, and several others were injured. It paints an example of just how violent incel behaviors can get if left unchecked. Randy Stair, better known by his online aliases Andrew Blaze and Pioneers Productions, was another obscure YouTuber turned mass shooter. His YouTube career was pretty extensive as he would create his first YouTube channel back in 2007. He was possibly most well known for, well, besides the whole shooting things, his obsession with the character Ember from Danny Phantom. He had this bizarre animated web series called Ember's Ghost Squad where she and several of her ghost friends, all of which were OCs, would go on different adventures where they recruited depressed teenagers to join their group. Around this time he also became obsessed with the Columbine shooting, so I'm sure you know where that's going. In 2017, he would upload an episode of Ember's Ghost Squad called Westboro High School Massacre, where the characters would shoot up a school. Randy would then drive to his local supermarket with a firearm and murder three of his co-workers before committing suicide. This is definitely one of the stranger cases of YouTubers turned murderers. Diamond Gate was a loophole in YouTube's algorithm that I believe was discovered first on Reddit. There are, or maybe were, thousands of videos titled stuff like Best Diamonds in the World, Best Car Insurance, Diamond Sky, Top 10 Best Diamonds in High School. These videos would often start out like seemingly legit videos in order to avoid bot detection. However, halfway through the videos, it would cut to softcore pornography of women, sometimes even underage. These videos would have them partaking in lewd actions such as wearing bathing suits, undressing, or posing in inappropriate ways and the girls featured were as young as six years old. It would then cut back to the footage shown at the beginning of the video, again in order to bypass bots. The comments of course would also be very depraved, with the biggest weirdo perverts in the comment section talking about how horny they are. In a way, this is quite similar to the stuff Matt's What It Is was talking about, although this in particular seemed to have flown under the radar quite a bit. Nowadays, it would seem as if YouTube has made quick work of these videos, as trying to search these terms won't result in the same shit. However, it does seem like exactly one video from four years ago has slipped through the cracks. Let's take a look. And his name is and thus concludes Tier 4 of the YouTube Iceberg. By now, we're around a third of the way done with the whole entire iceberg. To those of you who have been sticking around thus far, thank you so much for supporting these videos. I don't actually monetize any of them since I haven't hit a thousand subscribers, and I sometimes use copyrighted music anyways. I mainly just make these videos for myself really, as it just stemmed from no one's covered this iceberg yet, I want to be the first. That being said, I do enjoy reading every single one of your guys' comments, as they're a lot nicer than I expected. People always talk about how YouTube comment sections like they're the most vile places on earth, but I've only gotten nice comments. Again, thank you to all my viewers for watching my videos, unless you actually got offended by the Andrew Tate section in the last part. I'll see you all next time in Tier 5 of the massive YouTube iceberg. Take care.